Hey, Fazan, Jane Breckenridge, AZT, Yujiha Keda, Dande Gape. Good evening. My name is Jane Breckenridge. I am Yuchi and Muskogee Creek. I used to be the only Native American monarch butterfly conservation activist in Oklahoma, uh, maybe even in the entire country, but now there are thousands of us. Uh, it began with the simple idea that we could help save the beleaguered monarch by creating a migration trail and tribal lands through Oklahoma. It's uh, seven years and 70,000 milkweed plants later, it has morphed into dozens of tribes committing hundreds of acres to providing the lands needed to sustain the monarchs as they journey north in the spring. Just importantly, the tribes have also committed the resources necessary to bring the great grandchildren of these epic Lepidopteran travelers home again in the fall by growing and planting over 50,000 nectar rich native wildflowers grown from locally collected native seed. Our journey to becoming a successful monarch habitat restoration organization is much like the journeys the monarchs take. Seemingly improbable, but with little chance of success when viewed from the outside perspective, but driven by an unshakable sense of purpose internally. When the monarch butterfly population crashed in 2013 and 2014, I was the director of the Yuchi Butterfly Farm, located in the Muskogee Creek Nation Reservation on my great grandmother's original 160 acre allotment. It was dated to her in 1899 when she was 16 years old. These small parcels of land were given to each enrolled citizen as compensation to her people for the millions of acres of land that had been taken away from them. First by the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and later by the Dawes Act of 1887. Her father, Samuel W. Brown, had been born on the Trail of Tears and later became the chief of his people, the Yuchi tribe. When I sit on the back porch of the butterfly farm using high-speed internet to communicate with people all over the world, I can see the hill where my great-grandmother gave birth to my grandmother in a log cabin in 1915. It's an interesting juxtaposition. The farm is home to the Natives Raising Natives Project, which trains tribal citizens on how to become butterfly farmers. The project has three goals. First of all, to create sustainable employment, particularly in economically disadvantaged parts of our Creek Nation. Um, secondly, to provide hands-on science education for Native youth. And thirdly, to promote conservation of the ecosystems that support our Native butterflies and other threatened pollinators. When the monarch, um, when our conservation focus, we had worked on all, all butterflies, all pollinators for many, many years. But when the monarch numbers crashed, as we all know, back in 2013, 2014, the focus for our conservation efforts became hyper-focused on the monarch. Um, we particularly started to um, uh, double down on that when the recovery plan was released by USDA and showed Oklahoma right in the middle of the bullseye for critical zone um, for work that needed to be done. And there we are. Um, it was particularly worrisome to us because at that time, nothing was really being done on any kind of um, level, truthfully, in Oklahoma on monarch conservation. There were well-meaning individuals, um, some you know, isolated work, but really nothing was being done and our habitat is very, very badly degraded. Um, so, but Oklahoma is also uh, in a unique position um, compared to a lot of other places. And that is because 80% of the migratory path of the monarch in Oklahoma is actually located within tribal boundaries. We have 39 federally recognized tribes in the state. Um, and through our work with Natives Raising Natives, we knew that there was a commitment from tribal leadership to tackle this issue. It, in all my dealings with tribal leaders, I never once had anyone ask why we needed to save the monarch butterfly. Uh, the only question, was how, and it was drastically different than working with other non-native entities in Oklahoma at that time. Um, they've since many of them have caught up, but at the time, um, you know, when I would go to, anyway, I don't even want to say the names of some of the places that I went, um, and uh, who should have had a, a st been stakeholders in it, and said uh, that you know we wanted to start planting back milkweed to save the native, to save the butterflies. Uh, people would look at me like I was completely insane. I mean, they would just say, uh, but we're so happy. We, we're just happy we got rid of all the milkweed. What are you talking about? It was a complete disconnect, but not with tribal leaders. And I think it was really um, put best as Assistant Chief Lewis Johnson of Seminole Nation stated so eloquently, Seminole people were recently endangered ourselves. Now that the butterflies are in trouble, it's our turn to lend a hand and help them out. So. The, the question of how though kept on coming up because everybody was in, okay, 
how we're let's save the butterfly. How are we going to do it? And and it was and it was a big question. I had met Chip Taylor, Dr. Chip Taylor, founder of Monarch Watch, at a conference um, the previous year, uh, and and so I just on a you know I reached out and said we want to build a monarch migration trail on tribal lands through Oklahoma. Um, would you be willing to help us? And he got back fairly quickly and said, yeah, that would be very cool and very appropriate. But the problem that's gonna limit anything you're going to do on that front is the capacity issue. It, it was the first of many, 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 many conversations about the capacity issue. As he explained to me, Oklahoma was a critical area for monarch habitat restoration because of our location on the migratory path. The returning migrants needed to find milkweed there, and in the fall, the returning butterflies funneled right through there on their way back to Mexico and needed to find nectar resources. However, big however, there was no capacity for monarch habitat restoration in our state. We didn't have locally sourced native milkweed seeds or organic greenhouses to produce the seedling plugs. We didn't have locally uh, sourced native nectar plant seeds or organic greenhouses to grow them out either. We also didn't have anyone in this state with experience in monarch habitat restoration, specifically on site preparation, plant installation, and long-term site maintenance. Oh, well, there, there was that. Okay, uh, I guess. But somehow, I convinced Chip that the tribes were willing to take on the capacity to save the monarchs, and he signed on to co-direct the project. So uh, we formed a coalition that came later to be known as Tribal Environmental Action for Monarchs, or TEAM. And and we set out to tackle the capacity issue. Um, we secured a little grant from uh, the Monarch Joint Venture to get started, um, followed by more significant funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation later. The initial project lasted three years, um, during which each of the seven tribes committed 50 acres for habitat restoration. Um, but more importantly, the, they committed the resources in, in terms of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, staff hours, uh, to allow tribal staff members to uh, intensively train in all areas of becoming habitat restoration specialist. Um, and much of this was literally boots in the ground work and much of it was uh, in boots in the greenhouse, boots in the ground, boots in the field, uh, you name it. And much of it was outdoors in the brutally hot, hot, hot weather of Oklahoma in the summertime. Uh, we started with, we brought everybody up to KU and did um, intensive three or four days of intensive training. Um, we, we trained in the classroom. We trained in the greenhouse with Elliot Demler from, um, uh, who was the native plant nursery director that produced most of the native plants for Monarch Watch. Um, and then we got back to Oklahoma and we got serious about teaching people how to eradicate non-native species. Um, the, first, the first year, because we, again, the capacity issue, we had to have um, our milkweeds grown by another another nursery and then supplied to us, but um, but we got them in the ground. They were beautiful milkweeds plugs produced from uh, locally sourced seed. Uh, we got we got the children out there. We got everyone out there and trained them in all aspects. Um, people came together across tribal boundaries. Whenever we would have a planting day, uh, we would have representatives from all the tribes come in to help. Um, the youth would come out. The elders would come out and the tribes would cross tribal boundaries to all turn out and help each other. And if you've ever planted 2,500 milkweed plugs in the morning in the Oklahoma heat, it's, it's quite the task. Um, we had commitment from top, top down. That's um, uh, Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear of Osage Nation uh, out there planting milkweed with the kids and um, setting that example of leadership. And that wasn't just a photo op. He was actually really out there getting sweaty, working with those kids and showing them um, what, what it means, how we take care of our land. Uh, the kids particularly enjoyed it. Um, they, it gave them a sense of uh, connection to, you know, to the butterflies and what we were doing and the larger issue of land uh, sovereignty. And um, it was just great to see how the kids tackled this, this project. Uh, we did a lot of classroom training, um, augmented then by follow-up with field training. Everything was videotaped. Uh, this was this shot was taken down at the Chickasaw Cultural Center, um, which was uh, the Chickasaws were great leaders in this project and uh, hosted many, many, many events at their um, tribal uh, cultural center down there. Um, they also provided all the video um, capacity so these could, uh, training videos could be made for everybody, um, and we would bring people in from all all of the tribes. 
And then after we would do classroom work, we would go out in the field and we learned field identification of plants. We learned um, seed collection. We learned um, how, to, how to process and clean the seeds. And every time we learned a task, then we would bring youth in and train the youth how to do it too, to try and pass that knowledge on. Um, once seeds are collected, if you've ever been involved in this kind of work, uh, they have to be dried and then cleaned, which is no easy task. Um, again, we just, uh, people who had had experience with it, uh, trained and shared that knowledge with others. And we just spent hundreds of hours training and learning how to do this. Once the seeds are cleaned, um, were cleaned in the project, then they were, everything was done and um, classified according to uh, Bailey, Bailey's ecoregions and um, sorted. And then um, within the ecoregions, we would uh, exchange uh, seeds across tribal boundaries for, so if a, a particular tribe, um, they were looking for a native nectar plant had been extirpated in their lands, then, um, then the tribe neighboring would go ahead and provide it to them. So um, it was a way that we could increase the robustness, the robustness of our biodiversity and our restoration plots. Um, again, uh, after those seeds were done, then they were uh, grown out in hoop houses as a part of the project uh, with grant funding, uh, courtesy of uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Each each tribe that was participating, a part of the original coalition, got a hoop house, a non-native, uh, a um, non-heated greenhouse, and so they were able to grow all those seeds out to, for the um, to create plugs, which could then be field planted. Um, so, this was the initial three-year project period was so successful that in it has actually spawned a much larger organization now, uh, which is the Tribal Alliance for Pollinators. Uh, or TAP. TAP provides training, supplies, equipment, seeds, everything um, that anybody needs to, for tribes to restore habitat um, on their on their land. So, and we work with tribes not just across Oklahoma but across North America. Um, we also TAP also has the largest and I think perhaps only native seed bank in Oklahoma. We have over 150 species currently. So when this project started, I assumed that the tri st tribal staff participating would all be from the environmental department of each tribe. All of the tribes in Oklahoma have large environmental departments um, as a part of their professional staff, and it seemed like a natural extension of those responsibilities. However, um, over half of the, of the project leads of the tribes we were working with actually came from the cultural department of the tribe. And I think that that is a key part of understanding why this project succeeded and why, is it continue, why it continues to thrive. How we treat our lands is an assertion of our sovereignty as nations and an affirmation of our most deeply held cultural values about protecting the land. When we restore our lands, it's not a job, it's, it's our forever home. And it's also the forever home of the, the creatures that live there. In the Yuchi language, Whenever we're speaking, um, every time we, a noun is used, uh, and the structure of the language defines if we're talking about a yuchi or a non-yuchi. And that uh, the non-yuchi could be somebody from a different tribe. They could be a non-native person. Uh, they can be an animal. They can be the moon. They can be the sun. They're all non-yuchis to us, linguistically speaking. Um, and this isn't as exclusionary as it sounds because um, Zona, the son, uh, we consider our mother. She gave, she gave birth to the first Yuchi. She dropped uh, a drop of blood on the earth and that became the first Yuchi person. And so even, even Zona, our mother, she's, she's a non-Yuchi, she's away. So um, they're all equal to us. And in our language, literally, we don't have a word for animals. They're just, they are just non-Yuchis. Um, and they're just non-Yuchi people. It's, it's a different way to looking at it. And one of the other interesting things about Yuchi language is that every time we speak of an object, we have to identify with a suffix in the noun, the relationship of that object to, um, to, the, to the earth. So um, is it a chi, which is a thing sitting on the earth? or is it a fa, which is a thing standing on the earth, or is it an a, which is something laying against the earth? So I would challenge all of you to think like a Yuchi just for a day. See living things, all living things as your equals and consider every time you speak, what, how what you're speaking of is connected to the earth.
after you do that, then please do something about it. Because sitting at home and feeling bad about all the monarchs dying isn't going to do anything to help them. You need to get out there and do something about it. The scope of the problem is so enormous that it will take every single one of us doing everything we can to try and save these monarchs and save the planet. When I first started working on this project, I was endlessly frustrated because mainstream conservation organizations and, and I have to say a lot of agencies um, weren't including tribes as partners or potential partners in the fight to save monarchs. After millennia protecting and revering these creatures and as entities that control millions and millions of acres of land, I knew we deserved to be part of the conversation and have a seat at the table. I want you to have a seat at the table too. Most of you aren't Native Americans, but every one of you is a member of a tribe of some kind, and you know who that tribe is. And be an advocate for monarchs to your people, whether it's your school, your church, your homeowners association, your neighborhood, your bowling league, uh, your apartment complex, your family, your friends, your neighborhood, wherever your people are, ask them to reduce their pesticide use. Ask them to plant milkweed. Ask them to install pollinator gardens. Ask them to reduce herbicide. Old Yuchis had a saying, which was Yujiha Neno So Ke No No. It means we Yuchi people, we're still here. Despite all of the overwhelming odds and all of the challenges and everything against us, we have survived. My hope is that the monarchs will beat the odds too but it's not gonna happen without your help. I hope you would give it to them because the world that we're gonna hand down to the next generation, I want it to be as beautiful and miraculous as the one that our elders gave us.